Hey everybody, Joel Marshall here. Hoi, good to see you here on Lunch Therapy. All right, it's Friday, interview Friday. Yes, we are going to have an interview today with Gunnar Rohrbacher, who is a sitcom comedy acting coach and teacher of Actors Comedy Studio. And first, we're going to take three deep breaths. For those of you that might not have seen this show yet, uh, we take three deep breaths at the beginning of the show, which is a kind of crossing of the threshold from uh, the outside world, all your Fox News, your MSNBC, and all your COVID virus. Uh, we're going to take in some breaths, and we're going to chill out. We're going to give ourselves a, a rest here. Okay. And first deep breath. Take it in. Hold it. And let it out. Gunner's in the chat room, so if anybody's got any comments or questions, he's going to be right there as we go along. We're taking in another breath. Hold it. Let it out. Camila Lopez is in the chat room as well on YouTube. Take in one more deep breath. And let it out. Okay, without further ado, let's get Gunnar Rohrbacher in here for Interview Friday. Here we are, actor, comedian, teacher, Gunnar Rohrbacher from Actors Comedy Studio here in Los Angeles. This guy's one of the best set coaches, one of the best comic actors, one of the best people around here in town. That's why I'm really lucky to have him here on the show. And uh, thanks for being here. Thanks, Joel. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, Talk it's people. exciting. Talk to the people. So yeah, so here we are, lunch therapy. We don't generally talk about COVID in here and things like that. We could, because what we, it's kind of a break from that because there's so much information going on out in the world. And, uh, sure. and in this interview, what I'd like to do is I would like to find out how you came to be who you are and how you came to, you know, the, the stunning gentleman that you are. Um, did you, do you grow up here or what? That's deep. Uh, I was born in California. I was born in San Diego, specifically. Yeah. Uh, so I am a native Californian. Uh, and then I did a little time in high school and college in Orange County. And then, but I lived my whole adult life in Los Angeles, which yeah. I do consider my home. And did you set out to be an actor? No. You, no? Joel, you I set out to become a very, very serious journalist. You did? <laughs> I did. Really? I consider myself an activist. That's never changed. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, I, I, yeah, I uh, wrote on my high school paper and my college paper, and I was a communications major in college uh, studying journalism, and I thought that was going to be the vehicle by which uh, I changed the world to my liking, because when I was 18, I thought I could do that. Yeah, because we know everything when we're 18. <laughs> yes! I knew everything. <laughs> I yes, I was mansplaining before yeah. it was a term. It's so shocking when you find out you don't know shit. <laughs> it's startling. It's um, a splash of cold yeah. water in the face. Yeah, it really is. So when you were in high school, uh, were you like a class clown at all? Or were you a very serious person? I was a very serious person. And I was also very, very shy all the way through school. Yeah. Uh, I was absolutely an introvert. Uh, I always identified as a writer. Uh, it's just it was aimed in a different direction through school. Yeah. And yeah. like I said, you know, and then I started as I got into high school, um, I thought I was, you know, uh, 
headed toward journalism, but I was very quiet and I just sat back and observed people a lot. Mm -hmm. So what happened to your journalism career? Where did it die or where did it transform or what happened? <laughs> I, I never thought of it dying, but I guess it did. <laughs> it did, it, it died. It did. Uh, well, when I was living in Orange County, I spent uh, a lot of time, you know, uh, Orange County is, was and is in ways still uh, fairly conservative, uh, mm -hmm. which I am not even a little yeah. bit yeah. to be, uh, just to put that out there. Um, so even though I was living in uh, Orange County for high school and then a couple of years into college, I, uh, I spent a lot of time in LA. Mm -hmm. So I was driving up here constantly, uh, you know, just to go out dancing. Uh, just to see shows just for entertainment and you know it was just LA was way more exciting so I was up here all the time you know I'm a California kid so I had a car uh, and then one night uh, I, I saw a couple of other improv shows smaller ones and then one night I went to the Groundlings and I after about three improv shows and then finally seeing one at the Groundlings I had never seen a live improv show before and uh, I may be dating myself, but there were some truly great people performing at the time when I yeah. first started going, okay. like for ex example, Phil Hartman. Oh yeah, Phil Hartman. Oh, no. So you can imagine what happened in my brain when I saw yeah. live performances by people of a, a superior caliber. Uh, anyway, I quit college and enrolled in the Groundlings the next day. Oh, so you just got the bug. Yeah, I was like, what? I didn't know that was a thing. And now that I yeah. know that's a thing, that's what I'm going to do. And the Groundlings, for people that might not know, the Groundlings is, a, is one of the premier improv training and facilities and sketch facilities in L.A. And it's, a, it's been around for a long time. It was founded by some, some great people. I mean, one of, one of my friends um, was one of the founders of it, uh, Tracy Newman. And yeah, wait, you know, Tracy, of, uh, she's one of my favorite people in the world. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't she's know that. Good. I know Tracy too. Tracy's amazing. Yeah. So she's a, she's a musician now yeah. for my primarily, but she also wrote some sitcoms and she also is, uh, she's done all kinds of things. Magic. Right. And she then, was friends with Ricky Jay. She's just like an incredible, yeah, you gotta, <laughs> she's something else. Uh, but anyway, and she's a grandmother now and, uh, and she's, she plays the guitar and she's a folk singer and look her up and on Spotify or wherever. And, and but anyway, Founded by these great people. Her sister, of course, is Lorraine Newman. Um, and, Live. Yeah, and a lot of people from Saturday Night Live came out of the Groundlings. And um, it's, it's, it's like Second City is to um, Saturday Night Live. The Groundlings is in well. Chicago. Like yeah. Theater, theater school and a theater. Uh, there's a lot of performances every night there. But it's, it's not now, of course, but for many, yeah. many decades. Absolutely. So I, I literally, I was terrified. I did not, I was not a theater kid. I was not a drama kid and I didn't even know what I was doing. I mean, that's how strong the attraction was because I wasn't, I didn't ever even grow up thinking I wanted to be in show business or anything yeah. like that. So I, it was, I was so magnetized to what I saw. I yeah. literally ditched my whole course of action and mm -hmm. started with something that I had no experience in at all. So having not even been in a play in high school or college or anything, uh, I'll tell you this, uh, those people, I mean, I'm a professional <laughs> comedian and comedy teacher now. So it's- yeah. Did you have funny. an aptitude yeah. for it? Did you just all of a sudden just jump in and all of a sudden you're like funny, like right off the bat and people are like, whoa, what? where's this guy got this incredible talent? Was it like that or did you grind it away? Uh, honestly? Yeah. Be honest. To be honest with you, it was. What I had to grind away at was mm -hmm. the nerves because I had okay. no experience. Yeah. Uh, the facility to improvise, I just, even before I did it, I was like, I know I can do that. Mm -hmm. Like it was just so magical. And I, to be honest with you, I could. I yeah. was, I You're got a lot of, it. I had an act for it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I had no experience. Um, uh, exposing myself and being vulnerable and, and performing in front of people. So the nerves I had to attack, that's you actually shy. what it was. You were a shy person. Did you think, would, do you think, well, maybe I should just be a writer only or something like that? Or did you go, Hey, here's a, here's a challenge. I'm going to rise to the challenge. 
I thought, here's a challenge I'm going to write. I, always, I already knew I was a good writer. That yeah. had been validated all the way through my schooling, maybe mm-hmm. not for entertainment purposes, but I, I, you know, I'd won awards for journalism, et cetera. Like, I knew that was covered. I knew I could write. Um, so it was all about the performance and getting up in front of people and then making them laugh with so my wit. How did you overcome those moves? Uh, you know, I just, I stayed the course. It was mm-hmm. just consistency and I gave it time specifically. Yeah. Right. It's Cause there wasn't a magic pill when I, uh, you know, that you audition and the, you know, the audition isn't really so much of an audition. It's just yeah. like a, a over at the, the groundlings they have a very structured approach, at least now from what I understand. Yeah. Yeah, I have no, never they, taken classes over there, but a lot of people that I know have, and they say there's a very, very specific structure. You audition and then they put you, they place you somewhere. Is that right? Uh, pretty much everybody starts at level one. They don't really oh. place you. Even if you're experienced, they expect you to go through their program because okay. it's it really it's great training, but people shouldn't forget out there, you know, all improv and sketch venues, not just the Groundlings, they're all training you to be on their specific stage. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. general tenets of improvising and, and sketch performance apply, but it's just something that I talk about just as a teacher because sometimes in the in the fog of improv training, people forget all the venues are yeah. training to be specifically on their yeah. venue. Anyway, so uh, that said, uh, I was so nervous to go really? into my audition. Really? I, I mean, I drove around circling the building before I parked the car thinking yeah. I might not do this. Yeah. And then I finally did. And then I worked up the nerve to get in. My heart was racing in my chest. I, to this day, I remember who ran my audition her name is heather morgan she's actually a very good friend of mine now and she's a notable comedian and writer in her own right so she was just running through basic games so we were just sitting in a circle doing one word story couldn't be simpler and i was visibly shaking so much that i literally had to sit on my hands because i I, I was so i was so afraid and embarrassed now what what is the okay so you say that they all put you in the same kind of beginner class what's the audition for whether you can even go in that class yeah but that's why I said it's kind of like an audition in quotes it's not I mean it's an improv school so they don't expect you to know how to improvise there it's more like a screening just Mm -hmm. to make sure that you're good to go yeah and if you're not do they say sorry you can't take classes here or do they go uh we got to teach you a few things or come back again and try again Well, it's a little different now. Back when I was there, there were just four levels and four levels only. So Mm -hmm. it was kind of like just weeding out anybody who might be actively a problem. Now it's it's more or less the same curriculum, but I think they have pre levels Mm -hmm. where if you're not ready to go into level one, they can they can give you a softer entry. So what did you start doing after you went through the ropes of that? Did you start doing shows on a particular night? Did you have a particular group that you worked with all the time? Yeah, interestingly, I went through the entire training program, but uh, at that time in the timeline of LA comedy history, Acme Comedy Theater on La Brea was growing and evolving and becoming Mm -hmm. a pretty big name at the time. And it was opened by people who came from the Groundlings. So Mm -hmm. it was a similar program, similar everything. They had open auditions waiting for level four and my mentor, uh, my improv mama, Cynthia Segetti, who is mm-hmm. one of the school administrators at the Groundlings, and yeah. she's no longer with us, uh, moved over with uh, to Acme and opened their school. And she said, uh, I, you know, there's a lot of great talent here. You should, they're having open auditions. You should come and check it out. I auditioned. I immediately got put into the company and I went, well, I'll just do this because Groundlings is great. I love Groundlings. Uh, And I still have very good friends there, but it was taking forever. So I got into Acme and it was a very similar structure to Groundlings. So I ended up performing in the main company for many years. I became their resident Sunday company director for many years. And Cynthia trained me to teach when I was very young. And that was actually the start of my teaching career. I asked her when I was a kid, I was only like 23 or 24. Mm -hmm. And I said, "I'm, I'm not just in love with the performances in these places. I had, my teachers were so good. It was unbelievable. Uh, Tim Bagley, if you know his name, Mm -hmm. uh, Heather Morgan, Karen Mariyama, uh, Deanna uh, was my first teacher. She was one of your teachers? 
Yeah. She was a teacher. Yeah. yeah. And she wasn't a teacher for a very long time. So I was one of the very few people. Well, sometimes that... people see people like Lisa Kudrow and they think that they're just kind of naturally funny. And they just, you know, you put them in front of a camera, you give them a script and they're just funny. But they, you know, they honed a skill. You know what I, I mean? I do. They actually, cause... they actually, it's a skill. <laughs> when I, I teach, char- uh, teach class in comedy, mm-hmm. one of the things I talk about are comedy archetypes. And I talk about the archetype of the eccentric which is what she played as Phoebe on Friends. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I often bring up the example that I was there watching her develop it in -hmm. real time. She's brilliant. Developing that character or developing her nature, her her innate nature to be that. Over different scenes and the character might have had different names, but I saw her working out her specific strength, Mm -hmm. which was to play, you know, uh, characters with a skewed point of view, which is not for everybody. Well, but let's talk w- about that for a second. Yeah. You, you teach archetypes. Yes. And archetypes, you have, a, you have a, a list of specific comedy archetypes that you have developed. Have you developed this yourself? Or how did you, yeah, tell me. Yeah, they're called the heroes of comedy. Mm-hmm. And they're, you know, it references uh, like the archetypes that go all the way back to live performance, like Commedia dell'arte. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with a comedy and tragedy masks, you you know, we'd go into live performance, you'd put on a mask, walk on a stage and the audience would right away know uh, you're the king, you're the upper class, you're the merchant, you're the jester, you're the clown. Right. So that's where it all originated. Mm -hmm. So it's a reference in an updated version of that where I've categorized different personality types Mm -hmm. and then they're backed up and supported by examples of actors and their characters throughout television history. It's so incredible that pamphlet that you have with all the different archetypes, how you list all the people in the different sitcoms and where they fit in. You start to look at sitcoms in a completely different way when you watch them. And, it's, 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 and you're right. You're totally right. I'm not, I'm not as good at it as, say, Kamala is at this point, or definitely you, is to look at that character and go, oh, you know, that's a buffoon. Or, you know, or that, you know, so it's, that's a narcissist or that's, you know, but when you explain it, it's like, oh yeah, I see how that is. And I see how they work together to make it entertaining because there are all these different characters coming out of it from a different viewpoint. All of television history, it can be distilled actually pretty easily. And, you know, when I, when I do well, in typical classes, but sometimes I guest teach and do just lectures on like the history of comedy, et cetera. You know, it's interesting. I mean, I'm proud of the work I put into researching and understanding television, but what Mm -hmm. I like to remind people too is it was invented in the 50s. It's not that old. It's not that old. So in the scheme of things, it's not. So just going back to the 50s and reviewing what was successful in particular and Mm -hmm. what lasted, what became iconic, then that makes the list even shorter if you go you know um, if if you reference everything that had ever been created and canceled then that's a lot but what's worth studying is what caught the the you know what landed in the ether and what caught people's attention and became iconic so in truth it's not that hard to study that and then what i found is there were consistent personality types surfacing on all shows over all decades. And um, the other thing that I like to say whenever they're referenced is, it's not an acting gimmick or an acting trick. It's a way of understanding what people are like, because Mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is, when you include our personal individual stories, Mm -hmm. then we are all special snowflakes. But if you just talk about kind of our our core qualities in our at a glance, essence and personality we're all really easily definable and categorizable and you don't need 30 40 a million different categories to say what he's like or what she's like well one of the things that i really like about your technique and i I come from a you know university trained graduate school i was at steppenwolf for a while i did shakespeare for a long time shakespeare and company yeah steppenwolf and so i've seen a lot of different actors and a lot of different ways they approach me Right. Uh-huh. And, uh, and a lot of them are very afraid of things like uh, going for some kind of a result, um, 
putting on some very specific box, you know, character, like pre-prepared character. Um, so, and they're like, they're, or, or like, you know, like people that don't act sometimes will come up to you after a show and just say, I love your facial expressions. And as an actor, you're like, that's, you know, you kind of like, thanks, thanks. But it's not something that you're like trained to think about, you know. They, some people think actors sit, sit in front of a mirror and make facial expressions, practicing, <laughs> you know? When I'm happy, I'll be like this. When I'm sad, I'll be like this. And maybe some actors do, but in general, actor training is not that as much more from the inside, yeah. right? Yeah. So some people, I'm sure when they come to your program, they probably go, wait a minute, I can't do that because that's result oriented. But what I find with it, it is, for one thing, it is a shorthand because in, in Los Angeles, you, know, you come from doing theater, come to Los Angeles and all of a sudden somebody gives you a script and they go, you got to do this thing tomorrow at noon. You got to come in and knock it out of the park. And you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have to write a character backstory. I have to do some emotional recalls. I have to write a letter to my character. I have to do, I have to make all these notes on actions and objectives and all this stuff on the script. And then I'll come in and, and but I'll never do it by noon tomorrow. And one of the things that your, your method provides is even, even though you, you, know, you do whatever work it is, because whatever work you do, you bring out your character, because mm -hmm. as actors, we pull from all kinds of different techniques. But what your character does, your, your program does, is it gives you a very quick shorthand to be like, oh, this is this. And it, when you choose an archetype, all these other things come with it. You know what I mean? Like it's a whole package. So you're not, you make very quick decisions. And I've noticed that in your class, people make very quick decisions and, and they can come up with something hilarious in minutes. I'm, I'm heart, truly heartened as yeah. someone who spent time in my class that the message that I'm trying to convey came through so thoroughly. Okay. So thank you for that. And I mean sure. that mm -hmm. because Uh, I'm just trying to figure out how to say it. So going back a ways, because I've been doing this for a long time. I've been teaching for 25 years. Yeah. Uh, there were some people, a percentage of people who had the resistance mm -hmm. that you're, you talked about. Yeah. And I've been doing it long enough now that I have a way, I think, and I very actively and consciously tried to refine it because I'm not anti any other training that yeah. got you, you personally to where you are. Yeah. And I am not in any way aggressive about my way being the only way or a right way. Mm -hmm. It's what you said. It is a way and it's a shorthand way specifically designed for when you don't have a lot of time because, you know, and you brought up the word result. Well, Another way of viewing a result is you're getting a call from your agent saying you booked. That's right, a result. Right. Exactly. You gave them what they want, you know, what they, what they were looking for. You came in and like provided it because there is a specific thing that the writer is going for. And yeah, you can surprise them with your interesting choices and stuff like that. But mainly they're going, we got to find this character for our thing. And we, we're going to go through all these actors. So when you come in and provide that, people don't realize we as actors don't realize that when you're sitting in a casting section, session, it's only every so often that somebody comes in with what you want. You're going through a lot of, oh, that's not what we want, that's not what we want, that's what, oh, there it is. And you're just begging for somebody to come in and give that to you. Well, I did work in casting for a little bit and part of my POV point of view as a teacher, it was influenced by casting and in, in what you just said. It's yeah. not like casting looks at a bunch of bad actors during the day and then there's one good actor. Mm -hmm. It's and they don't really even no, they don't think you that know way. they don't even think that way. Yeah. Uh, how casting category you know rates if you want to use that word actors is how much are they able to carry? Are mm -hmm. you good for a co-star, a smaller role, a guest star, a slightly bigger role, or mm -hmm. are you lead material? Mm -hmm. Because we need good actors in all of those categories. Yeah. So and then part of how they assess if you're series regular lead re ready is if you know your own value and there's a distinction between casting for television mm -hmm. and obviously theater but even for film mm -hmm. and having grown up specifically in this town also gives me 
specific insights to how the entertainment industry works because we can talk mm -hmm. about acting in an esoteric way endlessly sure. and get nowhere Absolutely. but you kind of said it you know if the tv is casting for a neurotic dad it's yeah. then we do kind of need to go to neurotic dad 101 and just because I might have worked with you on your version of a neurotic. It doesn't mean it's a cookie cutter version. It mm -hmm. just means that we've spent time exploring what that breakdown is for you. And as a coach, it's really it, extremely pers uh, important to me that mm -hmm. I personalize your version of any breakdown. So it isn't a cookie cutter one. Mm -hmm. It's your version of one that's already worked out. And what I've also seen by having someone like Lisa Kudrow as a teacher mm -hmm. and other examples, how many people are sp successful specifically because they already had something worked out and weren't reacting to the breakdowns as they came out at six o'clock at night. It's interesting because I was talking one time to Diedrich Bader, you know, that actor, he's a great actor. He's Absolutely. He's hilarious. on American Housewife right now. He's hilarious. He's also on, I think this the new thing called the, uh, force he's mm. on that as well anyway but he's he's you know continually works and i remember one time just talking to him and he just offhandedly said well you know there are only so many people in this town that can do that and i think it has to do with um a skill that a lot of actors don't necessarily know um and it's it is related to sitcom acting and i think also a lot of actors are sort of um they look at it as sitcom acting isn't great acting what do you think about that? Oh, uh, well, are you time. trying to make my blood boil? I am. I'm trying to get you going. <laughs> uh, yeah, you just like threw some gas on <laughs> Match. I think acting yeah. for sitcoms is one of the hardest things in the world. And if you're in my class, uh, you know that that's what I strive for because uh, a lot of people come, you know, thinking like, how do I do comedy? How do I perform comedy? And, you know, they want there's a couple of other teachers in this town and I won't name names, but I'm going to be honest with you. I think they're worth about a nickel because yeah. they teach things like, here's how you hit a triplet in the dialogue. Yeah. Shut up. I've seen it. Uh, I've it's... seen it. Believe me. I've seen it where they're like, here's how you do a spit take, do a spit take now. And then, then do a, a triple and then do this. And you're kind of like, what am I? A puppet? <laughs> I can we... puppet your thing and you'll be pleased, but that's not going to necessarily make me good out in the world. One, one of the things that I always like to remind people of when it gets into this area of conversation, and then yeah. I'll go back to directly answering a little bit more, but sitcoms are worth a fortune in a way that most dramas or even reality shows never even approach. The mm -hmm. amount of money that the Big Bang Theory made for the cast and crew and CBS is astronomical. The yeah. amount of money that Friends and Seinfeld continue to generate 20 years after their beginning 10 years after they went off the air, 20 years after some of these shows went off the air, they're making billions with a B of new dollars. And people love these shows. They love, love these them. Shows. Yeah. And people don't watch and rewatch and, and like go to sleep with friends on in the background because they were decent jokes, but shitty actors. Mm -hmm. It's yep. not that way. It's not that way. It's because they humanized the humor and the relationships yeah. and the technical requirements to work on, especially a multicam live in front of a studio audience so that you're working at the apex of theater, which is what it is. People call it broad. It's the wrong word. It's theatrical because it is theater, because there is an audience there. And then you're also working to the technical aspects of on-camera acting, which is holding your body still as a frame. And people kind of have this vague notion that people are all running around like maniacs on multi-cams and you hear the audience laughter and there's all this big performance. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely not true. It's elevated performance uh, executed by master craftsmen who are able to elevate their intentions and emotions while holding their body still as a frame and practically singing while they're speaking. So yeah, you go ahead and give that a try. And then there's somebody Thank there you. changing your lines. <laughs> there's suits and writers and people going here, change that, do this. Now let's see you do it. Like yeah, you there's a love there. <laughs> it's called Video Village where everybody's yeah. the, yep, the whole team's going, yeah, hey, it's not that joke easy. didn't go over yeah, so well. So huddle easy. up writers 
and then they write new lines and give them to you on the fly and really agile actors are able to absorb them immediately incorporate them into existing dialogue and kill it yeah. it's not for the faint of heart and that's literally what actors comedy studio trains people for and i'm an improviser i can even say i'm a master improviser because i put in more than ten thousand hours practicing mm -hmm. that craft but i knew when i was a kid it was very clear to me that improvising is not acting tra training it's not foundational acting training they of course intersect and mm -hmm. all experience is valid experience i do not invalidate Anyone's you know time. you're in trouble when you start talking to somebody about an actor technique and they start telling you every other acting technique is wrong. <laughs> it's like when somebody starts telling you about their religion and they're like, everybody else is wrong. You know you're in trouble <laughs> because you cannot, you have to be able to pull from all the different things, all the different things in the world to be an actor. Yeah, but more specifically, the yeah. distinction I'm making is yeah. they don't teach you what an intention is and how to apply an intention to a line in improv. Mm -hmm. They teach you things about how to access emotions. So there you yeah. go. That would intersect. But there are a lot of things you need to do as an actor working with scripted material in front of a camera that are not even remotely addressed. Improv training is theater training. And now things are trained and things are always changing in the acting world. Things are always changing. So you can't be like kind of stuck in something because the mediums are changing. The auditions are changing the way you know, somebody comes up with a new form, like now there's, you know, there's multicam still, but now there's these single camera comedies and there's all different forms out there. And it's always evolving. And this thing that we're in now is gonna evolve it into like a completely different place probably. And you gotta be constantly moving, but have a really strong foundation. Yeah, I'm more and more, you know, I know we're not talking about the C word. I'll only mention it for yeah. this because in the context of things, talent was more and more getting discovered via yeah. and self tape submissions anyway, and people getting discovered because of live performances, it still happens. So nobody has to comment and say, Gunner, I got an audition because I was in a show. I know, I see you, I hear you. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also true that more and more actors were already being asked to self tape and self submit or work through technology and COVID has only escalated that and it's, also, I'll just say this for the moment, mm -hmm. it is the safest way to meet people and you can still tell who can act with working yeah. just the way you mm -hmm. and I are speaking right yeah. now. Yeah. So if it's a way to keep things lower risk, this is going to stay. So I, I will say this, people really, really need to think long and hard about where they're getting trained and what they're getting trained to do, because mm -hmm. what we're doing right now is exactly how actors we'll meet mm -hmm. casting directors. And it's what I do at ACS um, to prepare people for the realities of this is your new casting workshop. This is yeah. your new casting session. I mean, you can't, I think there's a lot of people that are like kind of putting the brakes on and they should be going, okay, I gotta lean into this thing now. I gotta, what, what is this? Have you said, I think as, a, as, an, as a, an artist, you always have to be like, oh, okay, so what am I gonna do with this? What am I gonna do with this? You can't be like, no, 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 this is the way I do it. Um, you can't do it. All right, so I, ha I have to cut this off because we can only go like a few minutes, but I, I just, I'm just not going to cut it roughly off. I want to ask you a few more things because you're, you are like incredibly wise about this stuff. Um, what about stand up? Do you ever do stand up? Or do you uh, teach stand up? I only did stand up once and I did it with someone and I did it in character and I killed. Yeah. I did it as an old man uh, oh, that's a, good. who was racist only because of his age. Uh, but otherwise, stand up terrifies me. It and does. I totally respect it, but it's not yeah. for Gunner. Okay. Now, Kamala uh, was telling me that you have a joke writing class. Is this true? Uh, I have a creative writing class, and yeah. I don't have She a joke loves writing. that class, by the way. That class where it's called what? Word party? Word party, yeah. You know, my wife is so happy after that, <laughs> after that class. You know, like a lot of these Zoom classes, you, you get like worn out, you know? She comes out of that thing like she, you know, cracked the whip. She just came, whoo, that was great. First of all, what she's is a great it? writer. She right. is a great writer. Really, um, it's, it's, uh, we do have yeah. exercises where we uh, create jokes, but then we do a bunch of other things. It's a fully rounded creative writing class. It's an automatic writing class uh, yeah. distilled from a lot of experiences I've had as an improviser. I was in the Warner Brothers Writers Program when I was a kid, and I've taken a bunch of different writing classes. So this is my version yeah. of 
creative writing with no assignments, no pressure, and putting all the fun and joy possible into writing. So if she feels that way, that's good because that's the directive of that class. And it really sparks, she says it really sparks the creative energy. Nothing like it. Do you feel like when you had shows at Acme that that really sparked your creative energy because you had to do a show every week or every day or whatever? Oh my God, it? yeah. I Don't you feel like sometimes putting your feet to the fire like that or lighting a fire under your ass where you're like, oh, I got to go in front of an audience now you know, yeah, tonight I mean, or whatever, it just amplifies your creativity. Talk about now. I mean, all those shows were sketch shows, meaning I was a trained improviser and I improvised in other venues, in other places. But when I was at Acme, it was a sketch show every weekend. Yeah. And we had to show stuff on Monday night to see if it would be in the show for the weekend. Sort and of we, like Saturday Night Live or something. Totally. Just like and, Saturday Night the show would ultimately get set and we'd have a run for about two and a half or three months, but we'd go into previews and I might go into a Saturday night going, I have 13 new scenes to learn costume, no. change costume in the wings. And I would be on stage 13 different times with 13 different characters Crazy. wearing 13 different costumes and changing clothes in the dark and hoping I put on the right wig. So, did yes. you ever get out there and not know what scene you're in? No. Never? No. Yeah. I, no. I, you know that actor's nightmare where you get out there and you sound you know what you're going to say and you can't find the mm -hmm. script? Do you ever have that? No. I loved it. I knew what I was doing. There was one time um, I, uh, I was directing the Sunday show and totally last minute. Uh -huh. uh, one of my actors got a job uh, playing uh, Michael Landon's son on a Michael Landon biopic. Yeah. Uh, and he was like, I can't do the show. He was the star of the show. And he's a really tall, handsome guy. The star of the show? He's like, I got to go shoot this thing with my, about Michael Landon right now. He, yeah, like right yeah. now. And so he was in like 12 scenes of the show. And uh, there was literally no time to recast him with the cast. It was before yeah. computers and stuff. You couldn't just send scripts around. And I was the only one who knew his scene. So, and I'm a short, you know, weird sure. character actor. So I actually was like, uh, I think I know all of Joel's lines. I'll really? just do it. And I literally did a whole show that I was never, I was directing it. So I knew it, but I wasn't in it. Isn't that fun though? It, it was one like of, the some of the best times yeah. of my life. And I got to play all these leading man roles that I was not ever you usually never would have gotten to. I did. I, I was the, the senator and the that. doctor. Really? And, yeah, I did fun. that in Silver Lake. My friend was doing Romeo and Juliet. And I had done Romeo and Juliet. I'd played Romeo like two years before. And he told me all about it. He's in and he's playing Tybalt and all this stuff. And then one day he calls me up and he goes, um, can you step in as Romeo in our show tomorrow? <laughs> and I was like, well, I did it a year ago. So I met, I just met the Benvolio and we went over the lines. And then I went through the fights, fight scene. There was, the fight scene was like, it was set in the future. It was set in the future. We were, and I was like Jim Morrison type guy. And, um, but it was the funnest performance I think I've ever been in because I didn't know what was gonna happen next. Sometimes I'd go on and the scene would be cut. Like, and I'd be like, oh, they just jumped to another scene. Or like I was in the balcony scene and there were all these dancers that came in and I'm like, do I look at them? What's going on here? And, and it was, it's, it's so immediate and so fun. And so, and something like that happens. Exciting, yeah. It was, you know? it was the training of my life and yeah. uh, I don't regret a second. Yeah. All right, well, thanks so much for being on the show. I really yeah. appreciate you taking the time and coming out here, uh, coming out here. I mean, all the way out here. Did you walk or drive or how did you get there? <laughs> well, I was in the kitchen. Yeah. And then I saw good. that it was I was going to send a limo. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was a delight. I'm very honored uh, that you had me on as a guest. I'm, I'm Super grateful. Fun. Super fun. All right. See you soon. All right. See you soon. All right. That was fun. That was a good, good one. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for the uh, chat room. Uh, the antics going on in the chat room. Also, Gunner, super informative, great guest. Uh, really upped our game there, didn't we, huh? Interview day is a fun day, right? Interview is a fun day. Uh, thanks, Jonathan, for your insightful comments. Doug O'Donnell, thanks for coming in. Uh, we've been looking for you for a long time. We did the whole Alaska stories. Uh, Jose... Great to see you. Jay, rock on, everybody. That was really fun. 
That was super fun. Okay, next week, um, you know, you got to watch Better Off Dead, right? Shameless plug. Oh, good. Here's a shameless plug. ActorsComedyStudio.com. Go there. You know, the cool thing about these times that we're in is that you can take classes with L.A. comedy superstar Gunnar Rohrbacher right there online, and you're the same as anybody in L.A. You're just right in there on the Zoom, and it's, it's, it's a great time, and you'll learn a lot. Jay, it's calling you. It's calling you. Um, Todd, <laughs> obviously, I now think of myself as a buffoon. It's cool because now we have all this, this uh, jargon that we can throw around, or I, we have these, these archetypes that we can start using on the show as well, which is super cool. And Doug, it's good to be found. Thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad we found you. I'm just going through the comments here because it's super fun. Uh, all right, everybody. Next week, you got to watch Better Off Dead on YouTube. We're going to have some Better Off Dead discussions and surprises. Um, also, I'm going to end the show today with one of my favorite people, Dan Dubik. Dubik. Uh, he's playing his guitar. He's playing Nirvana's Heart Shaped Box. <laughs> Anybody but Jay. <laughs> cool show all right thanks everybody we're going into the uh music portion you can still comment I love this guy. I don't know him, but he's cool. You can Venmo him. Give him a donation right there on the screen. I did. It's like a special guitar that he plays. If you find him on YouTube, it tells you what kind of guitar it is, but I don't know where he is. Looks like, looks like he could be up in the Pacific Northwest. I don't know. All right, see you, Gunner. All right, we're out of here. See you all next week. <laughs>